from deep in the wilds of Pittsfield Township, Michigan, it's the Grace and Paul Potscast. She's a left-wing conservative Catholic homeschooler who loves to garden. He's a bearded computer geek who reads and writes like he's running out of time. Together, they're raising an ever-growing army of adorable children and planning the revolution. Hello! <laughs> All right. I always, you know, close enough. I so like I, I have, wow. I have in the text that I'm reading, <clears throat> I have like markings for sound effects. Yeah. Because I want to do a thing. You want to do a thing. I want to like uh, do it up with like sound effects of deep woods and and like crickets and you know, what, does the stuff? moon make a, does the full moon make a sound? I guess that that's, was it. That's I, it. That was the sound. Yeah. So and then coyotes and wolves or whatnot, just to. Um, Spice convey it up a bit. convey the the idea. So this is our our pathetic little podcast for Easter weekend. So um, Easter 2018 crushed it. This is Easter Fool's Day. Happy Easter Fool's Day, everyone. It really feels like it. Here's why we're the Easter Fools. So yeah, it started last week. Early in the week, I was feeling a little bit sick, and I'm like, oh, you know, I'll be better in like 48 hours. I usually am. Yeah, no. Day three, the sweats began. <laughs> so I'm finally better, like today, Easter Sunday, I'm finally better myself. Yeah. Like, I, I feel like I could go out in public. I, it's not... Yeah. Not yet. But at this point, um, you've been sick. Slightly. Uh, Sam's been sick and is starting to recover. Joshua got sick. Pippin's just starting. Veronica hasn't said anything, but I think she's taking the opportunity to hide and sleep. She's she's getting a lot of extra sleep. So... um yeah, so we don't know exactly what this is. Whether oh, Eleanor's down, uh, Eleanor's down. Yeah, uh, and, so yeah, so we. The, I should just put it to put it in context. Easter for us, for our family, is a much bigger celebration than Christmas. Yes, and we actually look forward to it, and we sometimes do the vigil mass, and mm-hmm. we. We you, pretty um, usually start on Holy Thursday. Yeah. With the foot washing. Yeah. And um, then Good Friday. Yeah. So it's a multi day celebration. Yeah. And um, we also try and do a big meal and have everyone within earshot, you know. Come on over. Uh, yeah. And have a bite. Um, but no, it was just all falling apart this week. Right. And it's, it's really disappointing because you and I have been doing Easter masses attending Easter masses together since before we were married. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think we've ever missed we've one. We've never missed one. This is the first one we've missed. Right. Yeah. It's now, now Easter happens without us. Easter happens without us. It's I don't mean to like make it all about me. No, but it's not, but I'm it's sad not just not to us too. I mean, right. it's also my sister-in-law was planning to come for right. Easter dinner. It's a family and thing at a celebration with the kids. Right. And I was considering inviting some other friends, right. but it was clear that things weren't, you know, at best we'd have kind of a minimal, like... A minimal display, a minimal, yeah. a minimal showing. And we might be all, at worst, we'd all be highly contagious. Uh, exactly. So I, so I had to call off all the guests yesterday and just, yeah, and I, I kept holding on hope, but hey, you know what? I'm the only one sick. Maybe we'll just miss, like, Holy Thursday and Friday. And then it'll yeah, be a better Saturday, right. and we can all go on yeah. Sunday. And it's all fine. It'll all work out. But then, like, kids just started dropping like flies. We don't really know exactly what this is. I was yeah. not feeling bad enough last week, during the week, to not go into work. Right. And um, I had a flu shot around December, mm-hmm. uh, around Christmas. Um, so I, my symptoms, whatever... They are, for me, I could not really clearly distinguish them from this uh, thing I've had for months and months, right? Oh, right. This respiratory thing, which I'm I'm seeing a doctor for. Um, So I couldn't really distinguish clearly. It seemed like maybe I was getting feverish again, but I had this like, because like for months last last, um, fall, Mm-hmm. I had a mild fever every day, and I had right. this, this terrible post-nasal drip and this stuff, and, and that wasn't a virus per se. per se. That was like a chest infection that was just in for the long in haul. long haul, yeah. This may be a flu virus. <clears throat> it might be. Um, um, it's unclear. We're not 100% sure. It has the fever, the exhaustion, and the joint 
aches, the joint pain. Right. And I think I had something like it last summer. Yeah. Um, it's not a norovirus. It's not a digestive thing. Nope. At least not so far. Although you you do kind of lose your appetite. Well, that's that happens with a, a bad cold Back too. Home, you sometimes. just kind of lose your appetite. You're just not inter- Like I would frequently just end up inadvertently fasting all day. Yeah. And then like right. if I, I hit some soup and I'd be like, "Yeah, I'm all about this." Yeah. If the soup is, if when when your husband brought you soup, you're like, "Oh, I could eat that." I could eat that. <laughs> yeah. I could eat all of that. So yeah, so, so yeah. I haven't been that hungry either, but um, you know, yeah. I could stand to lose a couple pounds. But so yeah, so the idea of a huge feast was really like, huh? Not appealing. Not even appealing. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so we have some. I have some mild concern for Eleanor, so I'm keeping an eye on her. Eleanor is the one who's got it bad as like a respiratory infection. Right. So she's and peeing, and she's pooping. But you were watching her closely because thing is, if she does get something bad, we're not just going to take her to urgent care. We have to take her to Mott. Right, to a children's center. Right? Well, to to her children's hospital right, right. because she has what they call a complex congenital heart defect and that, surgical, yeah. you know, surgical scars and all this stuff. Prostheses. So, yes, we want to take her someplace where they know what's going on. Right. Or at so, least know the history. Right. So, <laughs> if if her fever spikes or if she gets real lethargic or seems to be not, you know, I mean, she's perky, tired. She's tired. She's sleeping it off, but yeah, but, but um but, but no, it's like a there's a like a turn for the worst. There's sort of a there's sort of a line we feel like we can tell. Yeah, you know. Yeah, where a child just doesn't look well. If she's like if she's coughing and complaining, uh, actively complaining, complaining. that's a sign of health. But if she gets really sluggish that or too, that she can't even complain to you. Or then that's that's a dangerous. That's thing. actually dangerous. So. Dangerous. But no, peeing, pooping, eating still. Yeah. Yeah, she's still nursing frequently. And um, so, yeah, that, that's, that's, those are all good signs. So she, I'm not terribly she, concerned, yeah. but we are watching. She's the one who's young enough that I'm concerned about her health and, and her symptoms are severe enough. The others are just like, oh, they all covered with snot and sleeping all the yeah. time. But they're not, none of them are bad enough that I'm worried about their right. like, safety. Like terribly concerned. No. I'm making them tea and soup. But yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're making sure everyone is hydrated and, you know eating some calories but mostly the hydration yeah all right so that's like what we've been doing for easter (sighs) that's what we've been doing for easter and i have the day off work tomorrow because i'm going to beaumont hospital um, check out your chest thing to check out my um to to have some tests done on my lung function Mm -hmm. and i think my like irritability of my of my um respiratory system right and uh, see if I what the doctor recommends for trying to manage this, and whether he thinks it's related to this uh, genetic disorder yeah, that what, we talked yeah, about. Yeah, alpha one antitrypsin deficiency, like the carrier so form. Alpha male. I am an alpha male. I've always done it. Anyway, yeah. Just recently, if you're following along, we talked about this a couple weeks ago. Mm-hmm. I just recently got my test results and learned that I do have the carrier form of this uh, this genetic disorder. I have like the MZ variant of the gene, which means that my alpha one is reduced, but not nothing. Mm-hmm. People with the severe version wind up oftentimes later in life uh, having severe disease from it and may need a lung and or liver transplant. Yeah. And I shouldn't need that. But the MZ form is associated with higher risk of um, COPD, Mm -hmm. chronic bronchitis, they used to call it, things like that. And that's kind of what I've had. So Mm -hmm. figuring out how to reduce that and treat the symptoms. So So maybe we'll get some news. Maybe we'll get some news. And I was debating... Whether am I sick enough that I should cancel so I don't like go there with a flu virus? Right. But I I don't think I am. Right. No, um, I don't think you are. I don't think you are either. So. And I'm not anymore. So yeah. Anyway. So we're not going to do a full blown topic today. No, we're just here to you know mark the day and tell you we love you. <laughs> I wanted to run through a little bit of what we've been up to. Sure. Sounds good. So last Tuesday, we went to a talk 
uh, at Mason Hall on Central Campus, University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Yeah. Professor Elizabeth Anderson, um, her topic was Private Governments in the Workplace. Yeah. What, what's, did we, do we have the name of her book down there? Private, I think her book is Private Government. Oh, Private Government. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And I'll try and remember to put a link into it. For the book. For the, a link from the show notes. Um, so what she was talking about is uh, how in a workplace we have this system that we consider to be liberating usually and fair. You get a check. And, and fair. Yeah. You know, and all, that, all these things under capitalism, but which in her analysis comprises a kind of a unique form of government that the state allows employers to have over employees. Right. Uh, and, and a private rather than public form of government. Right. And she doesn't, the, the analysis was quite interesting. She doesn't mean it just strictly in terms of public versus private sector. It's but, yeah. about this employee-employer relationship where it has more to do with the fact that employer employees are at will and you know oh oh i i can i do this part you want to do this part yeah yeah i don't have my all my notes with me no but i i this was i thought the most interesting part of her her talk her analysis yeah yeah hands on she's a philosophy professor so slightly abstract but it's maybe a little very insightful though maybe a little hard to follow but then do your thing and then i've got my version of the analogy But like if you if you get it yeah like this is a really big piece of information okay do it so she went it and when it pains to say people think of public versus private like this is the private sector this is public because it's the government yes public is what is public to you what is open to Mm -hmm. um your scrutiny. Your, your scrutiny. Um, you're a stakeholder in it, and you have some standing to say something. Yes. Right? Now, if you have no standing to say something, um, it's not open to your scrutiny, uh, it, it's private to you. Yes. So, this is about your position with regards to something else. Uh-huh. So, um, if the government, if there's a government that controls you in some sphere. Yes. And you don't have to, you have no standing to make claims on this. She government. used that phrase a lot. What's your standing What's your with standing respect with, to with this government? institution? Right. Yeah. You have no authority. Yep, authority. And um, they can sanction you. Yep. And you can't like appeal or you know you have no rights to do anything about that. Uh huh. That government is private yeah. to you. Yeah. So this could be um, any number of places or realms. And there are lots, lots and lots of things that are private to you, and you know you don't care because it doesn't affect your life in some way. Right, right. right. But this uh, is one you're, you're. This is one you're actually you're, subject to. You're yet, subject to, and you, and you can't. You know, it's all this. Well, why don't you just leave? You know, your job or whatnot. Well, she demolished that. And no, that, yeah, that's she, easy to demolish. Right. right. She puts that out, pushes that yeah. aside. But that's that's what she's getting at when she says that the workplace is actually a private government yeah. that isn't in, in de facto a dictatorship. Yes. It's a de facto dictatorship, and it's a private dictatorship. Right. So even some dictatorships are public, and people can leave and so on. Right. But they're still dictatorships. But those public dictatorships are, are better still because they're public and not just private at the will of the dictator. Right. So as in a, a private government in the form of a privately held employer that right. that runs your life in some ways can be in fact much more pernicious than a dictatorial government. Yes, yes. And much more harmful to your health and your safety and your your interests. Yes. I think of it in terms of an uh, image that kept popping into my head as far as private government and whatnot is that it's a question of literally like uh, who is accountable to you. So in a yeah. in a public democratic government your leaders are accountable to you and you have there they actually you, you know that's why they call it representative democracy right mm-hmm. you have a representative you have someone to call mm-hmm. um in a, a workplace like this uh, so in that kind of situation they have to be looking down your leaders have to be looking down at, right. at down the hierarchy at the grassroots theoretically at least they do mm-hmm. um although you know the way it really works with funding and Citizens United and all that and campaign finance. Mm-hmm. That you know you can 
pretty much draw your conclusions as to where they really spend their time looking to, yeah. you know. But in this kind of workplace environment, your boss is looking up. Right. Up the hierarchy. Yeah, it's, not, it's largely unconcerned with... Yes, and if you... And then, you know, if you bring a concern to human resources, say, mm-hmm. their concern is automatically not necessarily designed for your interests. Right. They're, no, automatically their interest is not you. Right. So they're not... So everyone's looking up the hierarchy and right. not down the hierarchy. Right. So um, so they're punching down, <laughs> right, Ding. in comedy terms. Right. And I'm also reminded there was sort of a famous uh, cartoon piece of poster art where, like, if you're on top, you know, there's a like a bunch of birds on levels on perches, right? Mm-hmm. If you're on top, things look pretty good. If you're at the bottom, you look up and all you see are assholes. Right? Oh, they're I all, see everywhere. They're all pooping on each other. All pooping on and each other. And the ones at the bottom are completely encased in bird poop. Yeah, it's pretty bad. It's at the bottom of the. It's one. funny. Anyway, uh, yeah, fat, sad and funny. Well, actually, what what was really what really left off the screen? The screen to me. She did a PowerPoint, right. of course. Um, let's say the page, but it wasn't a page. Um, was that given her definition? We we live in and have lived in a totalitarian government for a long time. I've been, which I've been saying, but philosophically speaking, that's that's just a fact. We have a veneer, yes, yeah, a veneer of plausible deniability, right? But you know, if it's not accountable to me, you know, and I don't have any standing to change anything, and, you know, that that's actually a private government, right? And that's where we already are with our literal government that we think of as public. Right. She then had a bunch of uh, sort of horrific examples, for example. In, work, in the workplace. Yeah. For example, uh, slaughterhouse workers that aren't allowed to take a break to urinate because they're not required to give right. this to their employees. And they actually expect them to just wear diapers. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's that's one example. Then there's garment workers and their wages, sweatshop conditions. You know, there's she, she had a number of examples. And if you're, you know, into labor issues, these are not uh, new. It's not news, no. But she's just highlighting them. Mm-hmm. And then her uh, remedies. <laughs> yeah, that's her little baby with her hacking miserable, cough. Miserable little baby. Yeah. The remedies part talked about how do you bring more workplace or democracy to the workplace. Yes. And that's where things get difficult <laughs> and yeah. interesting because without, you know, with union rights going unenforced, you know, and your right. your rights to organize very frequently being punished with no one um, taking the side of the workers to defend defend your right to organize, you know, there's really only so much you can do. The the totalitarianism is is bad. <laughs> yes. And it's really bad, especially in the United States where we our labor law has no teeth to begin with, and then right. that toothless labor law is unenforced. It's unenforced. Right. And so uh, she talked about, she used a phrase that I've heard before in management, uh, but it's interesting to hear it used in a political and philosophical sense, path dependencies, yeah. where, you know, once a field has been plowed in a particular direction, it's, you know, easy to move things this way. It's very hard to rip move. up and start from scratch to really mm-hmm. change structures. Um, I think of it as there are, there are pretty hard boundaries on just how far a system will allow itself to be changed by working within the system. Within the system. Yes, yes. Yeah. And so anyway. The system defends itself. System defends itself. And there's a lot of money involved. <clears throat> and so, you know, I took uh, pages of notes and all this. And, um, you know, I feel fortunate to be in a, a workplace myself that is a small group Mm -hmm. um largely working with people that i like quite a bit Mm -hmm. Uh, there there's no one in our group or or our team who i would call like you know one of these horrible co-workers or something there's no one like that and i feel pretty strongly that um if we did wind up with someone who everyone couldn't stand that we would get rid of that person you know it would mm-hmm. t- in order to keep it from being a, a toxic but what if workplace that person was the boss though well i'm fortunate that uh i get along pretty well with my boss but there is no 
you know, this is not a worker-owned cooperative. Nope. It's not a democratic workplace. Nope. And so, you know, I have to uh, make choices that align with what my boss would like me to do. Let's put it that way. Indeed. Indeed. And, 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 I, and that, it's, not the, it's, not a, it's not a worker-owned cooperative. And what was the other one that she has remedy? It was like labor unions, worker-owned cooperatives, and there was a third thing. Oh. I, I want to say codependency, but that was it's like... Not, it's not codependency, it's not co-management, but... It, I, it, it, there a, was a co-word, and I'm... I'm sorry, it's in my, it's in my it, written yeah. notes. And yeah, I and I'm blanking on the co-word, and I... Yeah. But basically, it, it puts uh, labor... And this this works better actually for for companies with taller hierarchies, right? Puts labor on the board. It puts labor on the board. It puts uh, the union in the boardroom. Mm-hmm. It, it it makes uh, it, it insists that labor is representative uh, at all <clears throat> levels of decision making. Yeah, which so. which you know that's nice. Yeah. And I don't mean to dismiss that she was That's she nice. was suggesting that this was something that really assisted improved uh, workplace quality, you know, for the well, workers. She actually seemed to assert that it was the best option. That it was the best option, given given that with all the resistance and path dependency and structural barriers, that it was very difficult to try and figure out how to turn an existing workplace into a a real worker owned cooperative a real democratic institution and well into a, a into a democratically owned worker owned cooperative yeah and, and i i don't know I, the dismissals i hear of worker owned cooperatives are always yeah well um, that can't possibly work yeah like a, they're they're very light on facts. no it's just it's just a light weight it's like a pink fluffy defense of capitalism right right, right. So. so which makes me immediately suspicious and that's the reason i recall this codependency <laughs> right <laughs> Of the the asserted best option, yeah. When yeah. I'm pretty confident that worker on cooperatives are really the, the best should, option. The best option, yeah. What was it? Is it Bob's Red Mill? Bob's Red Mill just just converted to a worker on cooperative. Where he actually, when Bob decided if, to retire, if indeed he was named Bob, his name's Bob. When Bob retired, he basically gave the company to his to his employees. Sold it. He sold it. Was it was a win win. He sold it to them. At a price they could afford, and, and so he gets a retirement, and they get the company, and it's now literally a, work, a worker owned cooperative. cooperative. Yeah, yeah. So that's pretty intense, and the, you yeah. know, seems kind of radical for a company that it really is makes oatmeal. <laughs> well, no, it makes oatmeal, and actually, you see that that, that as soon as it became worker owned, yeah, suddenly, did you notice their product line diversified? That All court, the gluten-free stuff right, and whatnot. Their product line dramatically diversified as soon as it became workaround. Because, you know, he had his vision and this thing he was doing. He was doing that thing. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, it transferred into employee ownership. And they're like, hey, there's lots of places we could take yeah. this. I I guess, okay, so I do believe that a worker-owned, you know, democratically run <laughs> cooperative really is the best solution. But if we, um, if we sort of... St- hold to that and say this is what has to happen mm-hmm. then you're just going to wind up with a lot of i don't know co-op washing kind of stuff happening where yeah, companies yeah. will like create like a light and fluffy version no, of this bing, where like bing, people get to, you know they it's like putting out a stock s- options or something it, yeah it's like that. putting out a suggestion box and saying great now we're now we're democratic they're democratic right yeah and I, and I don't i don't want to see that i i actually want to see um the employees own the company. You would like to see, but I, I think that's a more realistic option in most companies for, for companies starting now, you know, starting up from the ground Actually, I think up. There are two places that where it's possible. Yeah. I think companies starting from the ground up can do it from the from, get-go. From the get-go. Or and then they build up a whole culture. and Non-publicly know, traded companies with a strong founder. Yes. That individual can make that decision. Can make that decision. And, and it's actually... It's actually the best decision for the individual because he gets a reti- he or she gets a retirement and a comfortable retirement at that, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and um, they know it's in good hands. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, it, it was because frankly, you remember that the the there was a car place around here that um, 
Oh, Howard Cooper. Yeah. yeah. The guy retired, right? Yeah. And instead of selling it to his employees, yeah. motherfucker sold it to another dealership. car de- dealership. And then... The dealership took over. Took over. And these people are like... Like, you, you could actually hear them saying, what a great, we have a new master, how wonderful. Yeah. Like, it was so sick yeah. reading this article. Yeah. And so, but that was the, did the fire, owners. Did he fire everyone? The new, did, no, he didn't, no. no, he didn't fire everyone. But they... um. That was the thing. The owner was negotiating to make sure that he wasn't going to fire everyone, that everyone would keep their jobs. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. basically, you know, don't ship anyone down river. Yeah. Don't, you know, you can't beat them. Yeah. You got to be nice to them. All right? All right, now you can have them. They're yours. Well, it was really, really uh, sick and depraved. And now here's the thing. The reason he went for that is he wanted a retirement. I see. He wanted to sell it. And get something and for get it, something out of it for his retirement, and then right, move on. A significant and he thing. never, you know, selling it to the employees was not on the radar, not a mechanism, not anything the state or any infrastructure prepared for him. And in fact, in the state of Michigan, if you want to start a cooperative, you have to found a corporation mm-hmm. and then insert co- cooperative language in your bylaws. Hmm, okay. But there's actually no cooperative form yeah, for you to file to start out. with the state. Right, so those are. I think that I think it's uh, bifurcated, where you can start a cooperative, uh-huh. and you could um, ha- t- take over from a founder mm-hmm. and convert it. Because that's, I mean, that's how was it? Uh, Johnny selected seeds, um, high mowing seeds, all these really great companies. Oh, uh, King Arthur Flower. Yeah, all of these places are employee owned, and great places to work. Yeah, honestly, great products. Happy to do business with them. Um, I think they either started employee-owned, were started by employees who invested, or they were buyouts from a founder. Interesting. Okay. So I think that that can happen. It can happen. Um, I can. So, but but part of her part of her point was that it's the state that allows these sort of this version of private government to allows, to flourish encourages. yeah exactly well I, it creates it creates the creates and in the same way that that you know the quote free market is a very carefully planned and organized you I know want it. that's considered communism to talk about a planned economy but that's exactly what we have right. you know a planned economy where we create a market and put very clear limits and boundaries and controls on the market right and workplaces are like that right so anyway it was interesting it was a good talk Mm -hmm. you were i'm interested in reading the book yeah i think we're gonna we're gonna track down a copy of the book you were a little uh peaked yeah you were a little a little sick yeah i was was not my best i had lots of questions but my voice was so croaky i didn't even want to try yeah yeah there was a good q a session afterwards And Two aces was, was as long as the yeah, station. which was nice that she arranged the the woman running it um, arranged for the space. She arranged, yeah, left <clears throat> left enough time and, and hung out with us long enough to until everyone basically got tired of it. Right. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. so that that was good. And I just want to say this was organized, arranged under the auspices of somehow of the uh, Huron Valley DSA. DSA. Democratic Socialists of America. We're not actually an organizing arm of the DSA, just to be clear. We're not. I, I don't feel entirely comfortable with everything they do and everything they stand for, but they're our Big Ten organization. I have not actually joined yet. Mm-hmm. I see them more, actually, more as social democrats than as democratic socialists, even though they call themselves the uh, mm-hmm. the other. <laughs> right, right. And what I mean by that is they're uh version it's like bernie calls bernie sanders calls himself uh a democratic which one does he call himself i think he calls himself a social democrat i think i always get confused no that uh, uh i shouldn't have asked you if i didn't know because yeah, yeah. <laughs> now i can't, now you can't tell, tell if you're right or not right anyway he bernie sanders is a is a very light socialist right like super light he's he's, he, yeah. he's considered uh, I, I, the rhetoric I hear now on Twitter and the, the phrases people starting to use, uh, they refer Comical. to him as a as a hard left populist. Which and, is not true. And the idea that he's hard left is comical. It's right. just, it's it belies a complete misunderstanding of 
all of American political Both. history and and European and political, political history. history. Like yeah. the whole, the, it belies a fundamental misunderstanding of the words. Yeah, um, but you know, but a clear, clear perspective of the Overton window. Yeah, so I think he social democrat to me is more towards the Democrat side, that is more centrist or right, you right. Know, and democratic socialist is you start out as a socialist and you apply you, you make some modifications to make yourself democratic, democratic. rather than straight vice up, versa. Up socialist. So mm-hmm. the DSA to me is more social democrat in that they're more soft socialist. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. There are plenty of folks I know and uh, respect and follow who are further to the left of the DSA platform. Yeah. As am I, I, th- I believe. But there's strictly speaking, there's not that clear a DSA platform. It's more about organizing principles for yeah. issues, you right, know, right. and a big tent. So, anyway, that we're uh, so we're we're interested in the DSA insofar as what what they're doing, what they're right. organizing is. So they're, yeah, what's your praxis? What's their praxis? Yeah. So this was part of their praxis. Having a conversation. Yes. Okay, so we're going to, we'll be looking into this uh, Professor Anderson's book and... uh, Hopefully a review will be coming. Hopefully a review will be coming, and she mentioned that she does uh, podcasts, so So, maybe we'll get her... Maybe we'll get her on. ...on the show here. And I can ask her my questions now that I have my voice back. (sighs) See, I thought this was going to be a really brief mention about the thing we went to here we are but then topic. you you got into it and you were waving your you know people can't see you but you were uh waving ooh, your ooh, arms Mr. and Carter. practically out of standing out of your chair like your eyes were all lit up and you know animated yeah. and like oh okay, okay she's got a thing to say got a thing to say yeah this is what always happens folks okay uh I have read a little more of this book, The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump, 27 Psychiatrists and Mental Health Experts Assess a President. I'm sorry. By Bandy X. Lee et al. That's bound to happen. And um, a few comments. So um, a few thoughts about the book. The first is that it's not a book, right? Right, right. right. And what I mean by that is it's not a monograph. Uh, it's a series of essays that were contributed. Um, the authors we mentioned last time, they are all constrained by the Goldwater rule in mm-hmm. that if they are psychiatrists, they're, they're not allowed to Off offer public. some official diagnosis of a public figure whom they have not, <laughs> whom they have not, they have not treated. treated. Right. And if they had treated, treated, they would be bound by confidentiality. confidentiality. Right. So, <clears throat> um, so they don't really offer a diagnosis. Yeah. Um, the book, it's well padded, uh, tall line spacing, and pages of footnotes after each chapter. Hey, I'm well padded. Come on. So it's a pretty quick read. Uh, you, you, want, you want a woman to be well padded, but not so much a book. At least I do. <laughs> oh, okay. Anyway. Fair enough. Uh, I guess that's a matter of taste. But uh, the chapters so far are more interesting for what they say that isn't about 45. That's what I found. Oh, okay. I can see that. So the first chapter talks about time perspective theory. I mentioned that last time. That was interesting to me. Mm -hmm. And I could think that it would be interesting to other people as well, not because it teaches you that much about time perspective theory, but that it introduces the concept of time perspective theory. And in the context of, uh, of this present hedonism notion, Oh, right, right. Which is maybe a useful construct for describing how certain people approach their, their lives. You mm-hmm. know. Uh, second chapter actually is about the history of the Nixon administration. Hmm. And it talks about narcissism. Hmm. If you hadn't taken several co- undergraduate courses on, uh, you know, abnormal psychology or, as they call it, exceptional behavior, mm-hmm. <clears throat> it, it would... Maybe, if, and if you didn't already know quite a bit about the history of the Nixon administration, it yeah. would perhaps be quite interesting. Right, right. I already had and did, and so it's like, yeah, it's like yeah. review. review yeah. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, been there, done that. Uh, the third chapter is by the ghostwriter of The Art of the Deal, right? So mm-hmm. I haven't read The Art of the Deal, but um, so he says things about Trump, about how free he is to lie and make up stuff and everything is based on his self-aggrandizement and everything. And right. 
None of that was really surprising or new. Yeah, none of that was So, anyway, like I said, it's kind of a slight book. If you are younger than me or uh, less educated than me and spend less time reading about politics than I do, uh, you're already... uh, Then you might find it interesting. There might be... There might be new information for you. Yeah. uh, I'll skim some more and see if there are more chapters, because each chapter is a different author, a different article. Mm -hmm. See if there are chapters that that have some insight. But for the most part, I can't really recommend it as a a book, and I, I don't think it's going to be like one of the defining documents of this era or mm. whatnot. Yeah. No, it's, it's uh, you know, it was craven. Honestly, it was craven. <laughs> it, it was a bit of a money grab to, to release it right when um, they did, especially given that this president hadn't been in office long enough to really do anything. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah. It, it's... Go, f- think, go figure, a lot yeah. of books are written for money. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I don't know. It's it's hard to really feel like it's a big send-up. I want to mention another book that I have not done a full review of, but I keep reading at. Yeah. And I believe it's it's a book almost in the same vein, but it's this. much. I think it's much better. Which one is it? False Choices, The Faux Feminism of Hillary Rodden, Rodham Clinton, edited by Liza Featherstone. That actually seemed like it had more meat. Point. Well, it had more meat on it, and actually made more sense. This seemed it, like its existence makes more sense. Makes more sense, right? These are the people trying to talk, trying to talk folks who are ostensibly on the left, talk them down. Yeah, this book was published before the election. Published before the election, and as was, fodder to contribute to the election. To contribute to that debate over whether we really should be electing. This is a good Clinton. idea. Right. And they are the it's a bright pink book, right? It's a yes. relatively small book. Um mm-hmm. and all the authors contributing to the collection are consider themselves to be <clears throat> left feminists. Be left feminist, right. Yeah. Including there's at least one man on the Right. In the, in so the, these are all left feminists talking to left feminists about left feminism. I, right. I, I think you get to do that. Right. And they're yeah. um and it's meteor in two senses. One right. is that it's quite polemical, obviously. Yes, right. Uh, and the other is because we have many, many years of Hillary Clinton's public life to draw on, her political public life. Right. There's a lot more to talk about. There's a lot more to talk about. So when they right. talk about her her bellicosity, right, her... her they have her foreign to policy. Po- they have to point you to. can talk about Honduras. You can talk about Libya. There's a lot to talk about. Yeah. Right. Now, these are relatively short essays. This isn't um, a massive... I was able to finish one. Yeah. <laughs> In the time, bits of time you In have the time available. time given to me. Right. So, uh, these are not... This isn't, you know, um, in-depth, but it points at a lot of other material that's out there, mm-hmm. and it's valuable to me in that regard. Right. Right, because it refers to a lot of other material. Um, so, and and... It, it actually it aligns better with my own sensibilities and with my approach to trying to be evidence based in your thinking. Right. You know, so there are pieces about Hillary and the carceral state. You know, yeah. the the Hillary. You know, more and, evidence. Yeah, Hillary and the 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 American foreign policy. Mm-hmm. Um, her attitudes towards. Um, Grace is standing up to uh, to hold rock the baby a little bit. We're going to wind up soon here. This is going to be a short show, but um, anyway, oh, the carceral state, the, uh, the prison industrial complex, the the drug war, you know, and specific and, and race issues, right? And then you know, I'm less engaged in. There's chapter on. Uh, Hillary's approach to um, abortion rights, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm I've just kind of disengaged from that from, issue. Yeah, yeah, I'm not making that my hot button issue either on one side or the other anymore, because yeah, yeah. I don't think I can contribute anything useful there. No, and actually, as pro life as as pro life as I am, I, I don't think it's ever been my wedge issue for me personally or my as been your personal crusade if you will right something, something my personal yeah. crusade it's not my wedge issue it's not yeah. how i litmus test litmus, i don't litmus test on it but yeah yeah 
yeah so yeah anyway so i let's see what notes i had um i wrote oh uh there's a review and a discussion with the editor and the contributors in current affairs magazine and i'll put a link to that um margaret corvid says this is a quote from the book or no this is a quote from one of the contributors to the book in my own circles i have a lot of liberal friends people who are saying to vote for hillary and are extremely excited about this representation is important to them i think the focus on representation is even worse than nothing at all because it closes out opportunities for us to say that feminism is about something more than representation it's about systematic structural change that gives women from all areas, races, classes, and nationalities more opportunities to be safe, more opportunities to have a good life and have their human rights respected. And so you can talk about Hillary being the first woman as a major nominee, but besides her gender, nearly everything else is against women. Oh, just, yeah, just about. And this is my comment from my blog. She's talking about what Grace calls the cynical abuse of identity politics. Yeah. Identity as a cudgel to force voters to fall in line because of her identities and the identitarian ideas she promotes, while her actual policies and records were completely discordant with those ideals. It's real, and people all across the political spectrum felt this way about Clinton. And so Democrats who didn't vote for her are blamed for Trump, but I still believe it makes more sense to blame Democrats who refuse to nominate Sanders. Yeah, that makes a lot more to sense. To blame for Trump. All right, all right. So there's a link uh, to the publisher's page, and then um, I've not read the book front to back because it's more the kind of thing like, I don't really want to finish the essay on abortion rights, yeah, yeah. but I want to read all the ones about the prison industrial complex, complex and, you know, policing and foreign policy and i've done that you know so uh, i think of it as a resource to dip into it's a source of critical ideas on clinton and clintonism and neoliberalism organized roughly by issues so Mm -hmm. i've i've been more interested in some of the contributions less interested in others i think they're all worth reading in general this book is more challenging better grounded in matters of actual public record and policy and a more worthy addition to the discourse than the dangerous case of Donald Trump. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, and they're very similar. But yeah, it actually, I think it contributes something more of value. Yeah, um, it allows us to start opening our brains to think about how to do something better in the future. Yeah, and it's one reason is that the people who <laughs> are contributing it to it largely are not embedded in this sort of professional administrative class and their yeah. thinking isn't limited to by that frame by that f- professional administrative frame where everything right. has to be within the system and you can't even it's pointless to even speculate outside, outside that the system, frame right. right whereas i feel like first of all it, it seems like gross misconduct for psychiatrists yeah, to speculate right yeah they're not all psychiatrists but and secondly um okay now what now what right Whereas I feel like that the now what is more is more answered in the uh, faux feminism book. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, my comment: both books run the risk of dating badly, but I think false choices makes a better case for relevance because the centrist feminist Democrat movement, aka Clintonism, isn't going away. It's not going away. It doesn't. That, seem, it doesn't require kind of Clinton. No, it just keeps coming. Yeah. It's really the, sick. Whether Trumpism is a coherent thing. St- Still, or will it, will ever be? Is, well, not even. Trumpism appears to be like yeah. a, the, a Tea Party redo. Yeah, which will be like remixed, and will continue to remix. Maybe right? remixed endlessly, but but yeah. as far as like, you know, what's the Trump doctrine? Right. Well, nobody can put their finger on that because the doctrine is whatever thing. he burped up after two Big Macs and two fillet of fish that particular mm-hmm. day. You yeah. know what he just tweeted on the John is his doctrine. Yeah. You know, under under Cheney, under the Cheney administration, George W. Bush had a doctrine. Yes. Right? That got called the Bush Doctrine. And it had to do with, you know, if there's even a remote percentage of, you know, of a threat to the United States, we must destroy the threat. Destroy you know. extreme prejudice. Yeah, that was the, the Cheney Doctrine, a.k.a. the Bush Doctrine. Mm-hmm. But... 
Uh, Trump, so far, you know, a, a narcissism and unpredictability don't amount to a school of thought or policy. No. I mean, you can call it. That, <laughs> yeah. But I, I don't think it's and, and the corporatism behind both the Republican and Democratic yeah, veneers is already the order of the that's, day. That's the order of the day. This is just ask. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So, same, more of the same, guys, you know? More it's of the same. Same old song, just a different day. Yep. So, uh, there we are. That was going to be, we, I think we went more than 30 minutes, didn't we? Yeah, we did. But, you know, I feel complete. You feel complete? Yeah, I'm good. We, uh, it, I, I was throwing my hands up in the air. I was like, okay, we're just, I'm going to have to post that we can't get a, a show out today because yeah. everyone's sick, everyone's, but I'm glad we, we took a moment, so. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see if we can follow up Thanks with the ideas on, about uh, private government. And uh, I'm, always, I'm always interested in hearing uh, a philosopher talk about politics because yeah, it's they... A, it's a little more interesting. It's a lot more interesting, actually. If it's a good philosopher, that person, not a Jordan Peterson, say, <laughs> uh, that person can actually break down the ideas and use words that have meaning. That meaning. Yeah, and make you see something in a different light, and mm-hmm. that's uh, that's what this idea did. So yeah, no, I'm always open to evidence. Happy to have it. Happy to have it. Okay, thanks for listening, everyone, and um, happy Easter Fool's Day. <laughs> we'll see you next week. Uh, we'll see you next week. You've been listening to the Grace and Paul Podcast. Check out the show blog at podcast.blogspot.com, where you can leave comments or search for the Grace and Paul Podcast on Facebook or YouTube.